A couple of other people who are here to help me do this presentation. Dick Godreau. Dick is uh, new to our team. And Blaine Cody. Blaine comes from the EMA. I, I guess the first thing I want to say is that these have been great presentations. I'm seeing some common themes. And I'm going to be very brief, but I've done four presentations in the last 30 days, and they've all run long. So we're going to try to stay on time. That's really the goal. <clears throat> so I've just done our introduction. Uh, nothing here is to be interpreted as, a, as an endorsement. Uh, you know, we're, we're all using a lot of DJI product, and we hope that that's really the that's really the answer because there, but there are some issues with DJI since they're not made in the USA. And uh, I know that Dwayne probably has vetted that to some degree. <coughs> York County is located at the bottom of the state of Maine. We own about 35 miles of the I-95 corridor in our county. So we do have a vested interest in this information. And pardon me while I just take a look here. I had a couple other. I, I want to I say that we have a volunteer team. This is not a paid team that we've involved uh, other agencies with. It's only the EMA. What we are and what we've found is that we're a problem, we're, we're a solution looking for a problem. And, and we're trying to educate the, count, the county towns, 29 of them, in how we can assist. So all our equipment was purchased with taxpayer dollars and we want to be a resource that's available to our towns. And that's really been the challenge. And we've, had, uh, we've, we've integrated some training opportunities in order to uh, show the results and show the benefits of what the drone program can, can do. Next. So in 2016, the director, Art Cleaves, uh, purchased, a, purchased a drone and we went from there the Part 107 was not developed at that time, but we applied for a COA, received it. And the goal is, next, the goal is to supply, uh, support the town, <coughs> towns in our county, state, federal agencies as possible. We're open to it. We're open to helping in any way that we can. We've also committed ourselves to safe and successful operations. We operate <coughs> within state and local laws. You have to be concerned with piping plovers on the beach. There are a lot of agreements that local towns might have with other agencies, and you have to consider those. And lastly, to develop a center of excellence as a working model for UAS operations in the state of Maine. Potential real world missions include structure, structure fires, forest fires, vehicle accidents, search and rescue. Uh, you can see that uh, damage assessment to support FEMA and to support the towns in order to file for damage uh, recovery is important as well. We'll show you a picture later on that. And then indoor fires, I want to note this because we, we participate, a fire department in, in one of our towns had a defense contractor and they had a fire burning in one of their kilns. So they evacuated the building but they didn't want to send a firefighter inside. So actually we flew a drone inside in ATTI mode, as Dwayne mentioned earlier, and we were able to uh, see the fire and assess that it wasn't to the level that it was gonna be an extreme danger. Uh, but on the way out, we clipped one of those hanging cords, as you see in manufacturing facilities, and it went down to the floor. But we hadn't done any indoor training at that point. So that's something that's very important, and the FAA doesn't own the space inside this room. Uh, we identified the potential agencies that were, were open-minded to supporting, but we only support if we're invited. Regulatory issues of the UAS section. Now, I, I'm sensing that we have some UAS operators in the room, and I'm sensing some people maybe are just looking to start something up. We're le learning as we go. Dwayne's done an outstanding job setting up his program, uh, but we operate as well under the 107, and we have a certificate of authority, and then following state and local ordinances. We have a leadership structure. So remember, we're just a small EMA, but our leadership structure, which is made up of volunteer team, 
is uh, made up of people with variable skills. We have an emergency doctor. We have a CAD engineer. We have a, another commercial pilot, actually an airline pilot that flies international. So we have a varied group, and everybody brings something different to the table. Um, <clears throat> for our air equipment, we're flying only DJI, and that's for consistency and standardization. Uh, we have one of the old octocopters, which has eight rotors, and we, ins we fly an Inspire 1 and three DJI Mavic Pros. Yes? Sorry, the COA, does that cover you on all of the waiver items under 107, or is it specific to just a couple? The COA, the COA uh, authorizes us to fly these aircraft as public use aircraft as defined in the U.S. Code. Now, having said that, <laughs> there are some specific missions that you're allowed to fly within the COA, law enforcement, intelligence gathering, uh, natural, national disaster, those kinds of things fall under that. We have also a night waiver, so we do and can fly at night. But the 107, as Dwayne uh, explained, we also fly a mission under COA or a mission under 107, depending on what the mission uh, purpose is. Does that answer your question? Yes, so you have the government on the COA and then for individual missions you'll get waivers that are specific to those operations? Yes, and, and there are various, there are different reporting requirements under each. And when you apply for it, did you apply for all of those? Did you apply? No, we applied, we applied for the public use aircraft purpose under the U.S. Code. Next. These are the aircraft we have. We do have some FPV goggles. We don't use them a lot. And we do require at least one visual observ observer. The daisy chain observer makes us nervous. Next. I'm going to turn it over to Dick. Are you welcome to join me up here? Sure. <coughs> we, uh, we currently have a capability where we can also live stream video and pictures from the drones into our command van. Uh, we currently do that <coughs> by uh, taking a spare remote controller and linking that to the drone as a slave. So the pilot in command is actually piloting the craft and then a second person, which can be remote from the pilot in command, uh, is actually controlling the gimbal on the camera. And that uh, video and the pictures, as I said, are being streamed to our command van. Next slide, please. Uh, inside the command van, we have a, uh, an operations center with a screen that uh, you can actually see the live video. And we also have, next slide, please. On the outside of our command van, a uh, monitor there, so that um, incident commanders, uh, people that are have a vested interest in what's being uh, recorded or shown from the drone video, uh, can gather around and also, you know, share in uh, the video the information that's coming from the drone. Uh, we're also working on finding alternatives to using the slave controller. Uh, we're looking at, we also have the uh, Connect system, as Dwayne mentioned, that we're going to try to integrate into our streaming system and uh, looking at alternatives of uh, maybe uh, finding some way of using uh, wireless HDMI links so that we can take the HDMI output from the controller and stream that off to a receiver, be it in the uh, command van or uh, the incident commander's location or, or whatever. So this is all technology that we're playing with. We're also learning as we go along here. So it's uh, definitely a, a, a learning environment and uh, something that we're, uh, we're working with. <clears throat> so this is our, this is our certificate of, of authorization. There's the U.S. Code 49 U.S.C. 40125. 
this was initially uh, issued in April 2016, and then we renewed it in June 2018, a few months late. The COA may be canceled any time by the FAA administrator, and I think that's common. It restricts us to UAS under 55 pounds, class golf, airspace, below 400 feet. And we then had the addendum issued uh, in June 2017 for night operations. So when you fly a mission, you, you, you have to have an incident briefing. You need to have authority to fly. You need to, juris you need to know who the jurisdiction is, uh, is owned by, and do you speak to the incident commander? Do you speak to someone else? Do they have an air boss? Do they have an air operations branch director? So we also uh, go through a risk assessment checklist. Think of all the risks. There are numerous risks, from weather to aircraft condition, battery condition, pilot condition, birds, other aircraft, uh, power lines, you can just name it, it goes on and on. So you do have to, you have to take a breath. You just can't launch. Uh, <clears throat> so here's where I refer to the public use aircraft as they're defined. And you have those four categories that are very specific. And that's what, re that's what our COA is built on. And then under part 107, all our training and law enforcement activities can go there. Uh, and damage assessments. Next. Our, we have our operations plan that was signed at the highest level for our organization, which is the county commissioners. So our operations plan requires the authorization of the EMA director for us to fly. We require pilot in command plus one or two VOs. PIC must have visual line of sight. We also conducted uh, civil liberties and rights training for our team so that we would be sensitive and understand when we're in areas where there might be uh, private properties and so forth. And then we archive our video at the EMA and we preserve a chain of custody. And that's really key. And there are some ways where that can sort of leak out on you. And I'll touch on that a little later. Uh, so pre-flight checklists vary by airframe. You must define the mission. When you show up at a scene and you speak with the fire chief incident commander, what do you want? Don't just tell me to go fly on 2nd Street. I need to have a specific area. I need to know what you want for a deliverable. And then we can provide it, but we need to be very clear on what they're looking for. And then conduct our risk analysis. This is a video. Go ahead and hit it anywhere in the video major structure fire that was in the city of Sanford, Maine. Uh, here we go. How are we doing? What time do I have until? Do I have 15 minutes or is that, am I halfway through right now? Okay. 10 minutes, okay. So we'll be, we'll be brief. Uh, Blaine? Why don't you just speak to the mission? So this is a this was a general alarm fire in the city of Sanford. Um, three kids thought it'd be fun to go try to start a fire, and they did. Um, incident command called us in. They wanted us a UAV. We flew the G1000, which is the Arctic Copter. This was at night with no external lighting other than what was on the ground. So our 4K camera was able to see everything in the dark. Um, they wanted to know, in this area right here, there's another bridge just like that one. They wanted to know if the fire actually went through into the second building. And we were able to get video of it to show that it actually did not penetrate the fire doors that were still shut at the time. Um, and it prevented that fire from going actually into this building, building number one. The fire started in building number two. So that's what they wanted, that was our mission. And we did it success successfully. Yes. Okay. Successfully close that one, and then there's one that will fall. You can leave. So this fire, another one in the city of Sanford, was a uh, five alarm fire. Um, uh oh, stop playing. This was about what six months after that big fire at the mill. Worked last night. Okay. 
well. You can talk to her. Sorry about that. It's all right. I can. So this picture doesn't really show at all, but this is the original fire building. There's one right beside it. This building got involved, and there was two other buildings on the other side that actually got involved. It's a pretty windy day. Um, they wanted us to get up in the air and fly the UAV so that way we could show what we had in this neighborhood. It's not a very nice neighborhood of the, of the city, but we actually identified about, I think it was six propane tanks. So they were 420, it's about 100 gallons a piece that they didn't see at first because that building wasn't being occupied. It was just sitting there and all the trees kind of grew around it and they didn't see it from the ground, but we saw it from the air. And then they also wanted videos of everything looking down so that way during investigation they had placement of all the apparatus and all the uh, fire hoses so that way they could have that um, just in case it went to court. That's, a, that's okay. Good. Next. It worked yesterday. Yeah. You can just move to the next. That's okay. This there you go. Um, this right here is the biggest um, winds fire we had in New York County. This was 113 acres, I believe. Um, it's actually, the city of Sanford got toned out for this one, but it actually turned out to be the towns of Kenny Bunk and Wells. Um, this is at night. They wanted us to fly at night, so we flew over it so we could keep an eye on the fire line. Um, this is a, a, a protected area for water district, KKNW. Um, they wanted to watch this line, and you can see right here, that's a guy in a bulldozer. So we actually caught him moving his bulldozer as he was working. So that's, this is uh, infrared. So it, it's great video for us to capture all that, the fire line and this guy actually moving. So next. And these were all specific missions that they wanted us to capture for them. Yes? Did you have any challenges deconflicting with any manned aircraft in the area? Well, Again, and, and I ask because you hear all these stores of California where yeah. you actually have manned aircraft coming in. Actually, this, that was on the end of the Stanford Airport. So we did call um, the airport manager and let them know that we were doing operations. And not only that, but during the day we were actually flying with the Maine Forest Service as they had helicopter doing water drops. Um, so we had radio communication with them at all times. When they were up in the air, we were on the ground. When they were on the ground, we were up in the air. So we worked together and we communicated with each other. Same with the airport, we could hear every aircraft that was coming in. So that way we knew to get out of the way to land while they came in for approach and then landing. So it worked out very well. No. Now, um, you can see the guy behind the fence. You can run and hide it in the dark, but when you have uh, eye infrared, we can see it. So this was a school building. Uh, this was just a training exercise, right? Yeah. So we're just training to see if we could find the guy that was hit hiding. We found him. It didn't take very long. This was another training exercise. Um, we sent one of our guys out in the woods. This is in the winter time. Uh, we sent him out around 3.30, and he walked out. He had footprints. <laughs> well, we came out about what? 4.30? About an hour later, we could still see his footprints when he walked in the woods. <laughs> and he kind of hid. But well, we followed his tracks all the way and found him right off. So we were red. It was to show you how important it is. We can find you. Even an hour later, we found him. So it's surprising how much heat is still. And that's snow. So the heat from the guy's footprint and the boots actually saved the snow for that length of time. And we could, we could follow him right on the way in. This is actually um, somebody jogging. And as you can see, we use it. We can change the color of the infrared. We can go with either black, white, uh, we can change it. This is somebody jogging. I know it, it kind of looks like a, a, a pigeon, but <laughs> if, if you see the video that we had of that, you can see the person, the arms and the legs moving. It's this an anomaly. Shot. <laughs> it's an anomaly, right? right. <laughs> this was uh, one of the Biggest school districts in, in New York County, they were doing a, um, a drill, evacuation drill of this high school. Um, they actually trucked people off on site as well, but we, they wanted us up in the air so we could watch all the different points of where they would go out and meet. 
So we actually put the bird up in the air, and then we watch them all come out of the school and then rally at their rally points. Next. You can see, we can see one here. That's one group. That's where they had to evacuate to. So we watched them go all the way across and, and rally over there. This was a training. Don't, um, don't bother. Sorry. Yeah, no big deal. Um, this was a training exercise up in Great New Gloucester area that we helped with MEMA, our MEMA, not Massachusetts, it's me, uh, the other MEMA. Um, this was a hazmat exercise. And we had the uh, octocopter up at the time for this one. Well, we actually flew up around and then we kind of came down close and then kind of close in. We got a close up, they wanted to see what was inside the car. The hazmat team didn't really like that because it was loud and it made a, the uh, eight props spinning around had a, a rotor wash that they didn't like actually when we get close to the open car. So we kind of backed off and then zoomed in the rest of the time after that. This was, uh, was that last winter? Yes. So the last winter we had a storm up in March. Um, we had a nor'easter to come up and then we had a lot of um, storm damage from the waves that we, there was eight days of constant wave action over the seawall. So we flew and we got all the damage along the coast of York County. And we used that, FEMA came and looked at all the videos, they loved the video. So that way they can show you the damage, see this is all washed out right here. Then they put the, the um, Jersey barriers up to protect that house because they, they were still washing eight days after. So this was uh, storm damage of an actual uh, natural event. Same thing here, we're just another part of the coast. Uh, this was St. Kenny Bone. Um, so we were just taking more storm damage and splash over. And then I'm going to turn the stack over okay. to. Thanks. I'll, I'll introduce Dick again. So one of the things that, that hasn't been touched on at all today is the forensics of uh, learning why an aircraft did something that it didn't seem like you didn't want it to do. So uh, something that Dick has been working on is downloading the data, which is captured within each of the aircraft. And, and uh, analyzing it and understanding all, all, the, all the processes it was going through and why it did what it did. So uh, Dick's got a brief presentation. He's going to blast, blast through some of it. Yeah, this is a subject near and dear to my heart. Uh, I could probably talk all day on the subject, but uh, we're going to go through it kind of quick. Um, as you're all familiar with black box uh, data, commercial aircraft when there's an accident or a, 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 a situation. No. The first thing you hear is they, they're looking for the black boxes so they can grab the uh, flight data. Well, the drones that we fly, uh, the professional drones, let's say, all have that capability inherent in them. They do log all of the flight data. Uh, not only the pilot input into the controller as far as the pilot telling the craft to go up, down, right, left, uh, any of those commands, but it's also logging sensor data such as the compass, uh, the heading of a craft, altitude, uh, battery situation, motor speeds. There's literally hundreds of data points that are being logged in these craft. So this falls under what I consider the maintenance function of owning and flying a drone. <clears throat> One of the things that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> some of the information you can gather from uh, getting this black box data is battery uh, life, battery function. The battery is made up of individual cells. Uh, you want to make sure that the cells in the battery are charging and discharging in sync, that uh, you don't have one cell that's uh, totally out of whack from the others, discharging faster than the others. That'd be an indication that your battery's starting to go bad, and at that point, you don't want to fly the drone with a bad battery because bad things could happen. So you take the battery out of service. So by analyzing this data periodically, you can sense and keep track of your battery status. Uh, if, in, if for some reason there is a malfunction of the drone where you 
have a partial flyaway of a drone acts uh, erratically when you're trying to fly it. Uh, you can analyze this data and you can find out, okay, was it the pilot in command that gave an erroneous command to the drone? Or was it a sensor that was acting up in the drone that caused this, this anomaly? Uh, we had an incident, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple ways you can, you can uh, analyze this data. Uh, once you do grab the data out of a drone, you can either send it out to a third party on the internet, that'll do the analysis for you. Uh, a lot of times, uh, this can be a uh, paid, uh, like an annual subscription to get this service, or you can do it in-house uh, with software that's freely available on the internet. Uh, if you do it in-house, I would recommend that the person doing the data analysis have uh, a good understanding of the sensors that are in the drone, uh, how a drone actually operates in flight. Uh, when you give it a command to, say, turn right, how does it affect the, uh, the props and the motors to get that action uh, you know, made? Um, next slide, please. Um, some of the uh, information, this is just a, a quick screenshot of uh, some of the data that can be gleaned out of a drone. Uh, you can get information on the battery, uh, GPS status. Uh, right here you can see that I've opened up the major category of motor and there's actually about 40 different uh, subcategories under motor. You get the uh, motor speeds, the current going to the motor, motor voltage. Um, there's a lot of data that can be gleaned out of this. Next slide, please. The data is typically shown in graphical format where the horizontal axis is basically time from when the drone took off, powered up and took off, to when it lands and you power it down. Next slide. The other thing you can also get from this, uh, this software is you can actually replay the flight of a drone. So uh, it'll actually show you the path that the drone took during its flight. And you can use this data, the flight path, to correlate in time to where the drone, say, was acting up. If you know uh, about 120 seconds into the flight, something funny happened to the drone that you can't explain, you can go back to these graphs that are being displayed at that particular time and look at sensor data. Next slide. Um, let me go by this one, please. Uh, we did have one incident with one of our drones where we were at a training function and the pilot all of a sudden noticed that the drone wasn't responding appropriately to his commands. It turns out that for about 8 to 10 seconds, a drone was flying autonomously in ATTI mode. It had lost some of its sensors, so it didn't know exactly where it was in, uh, in space, and it just started kind of flying haphazardly. Um, next slide. <clears throat> this is a blow-up of one of the incidents where the drone basically just started circling, uh, circling around what we call cir no, cir circling the drain. It was just <laughs> circling an ever smaller diameter circle, trying to find its bearings. It didn't know what heading it should be flying in, it wasn't sure where it was in space. And then all of a sudden it took off and flew about 200 feet in a straight line, uh, started the circling action again. Luckily the pilot was able to regain control in ATTI mode, bring it back home so that we didn't lose the drone. Next slide. Analyzing the data, we found out that uh, the time period where the drone was actually flying uh, erratically, we were picking up a lot of warnings. It turns out these warnings were what was it's called yaw error. You can see uh, in this particular time it was you, we get 29 uh, warnings of yaw error. Another time 48 and then 26. If you I can understand the sensors in the drone, yaw is basically the drone turning counterclockwise or clockwise. That is like the bearing. Bearings are determined by either GPS signal, the onboard uh, compass, 
or there is accelerometers in the drone which can tell which direction the drone is, is moving in. If all of these inputs don't correspond and correlate within a certain window, the drone will say, okay, I've got some bad sensor data, I don't know which one to believe, so I'm gonna go into ATTI mode, where basically you're flying it with the sticks uh, and you're fighting it all the time. It will not self-hover, it will not self-correct. So you've got to gain control of that drone and bring it back home before you lose it. Knowing that it was your errors, and that had to do with bearing, direction, bearing, you know, uh, it turns out that uh, the interior, uh, the magnetic compass sensor that's in the drone went out of calibration. So what we did is when the drone when we got a hold of the drone back on the ground uh, and we analyzed it, we went through a recalibration procedure for the magnetic compass, took it out for a test flight, reanalyzed the data and found that everything was, was fine. All of the sensors were correlating and basically uh, it took care of the problem. Next slide. So uh, again, this Analyzing the data, I feel, falls under like maintenance of the drone. It's something that you want to be able to be familiar with. Um, not only, like I said, not only will it help with preventive maintenance issues on the drone, but if you have a, a malfunction, it can help you figure out why did it malfunction. Any questions on that? Or? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, message here is things can go wrong. So don't overlook that. And I'm going to do this one, uh, not this one. One last slide. No, I saw it when I, before I stepped up. There we go. Well, I'm going to do this one last slide, and, and we'll be done because we're, we're running low on time. I can't stress enough also standardization across all your platforms. And the, and the tendency is for operators to say, oh, I have, let me use my iPhone. Let, let me hook this up to that, and everybody wants to get in on the game. Uh, you want to be very careful because if you do have someone's personal device and there's an incident that could be law enforcement related or, or, or could be arson at a fire, you know, they might lose their device. So you have to be careful of that. You also have to be careful that if you lose, if you lose the aircraft or if there's a problem with the aircraft, DJI is not going to delve into the third-party app that that operator was using. Maybe that person's telephone has too many apps in it. He has a memory crash, and it affects the, it affects the app that, you, that he's using to fly your aircraft. So you want to be very careful about that. And we've uh, gone all to DJI platforms using Crystal Sky displays and, and controllers. That is essentially our presentation. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for having us. Oh, <laughs> one last thing. All right, so I, I'm going to introduce uh, Arthur Villator, and because Arthur came to us, and he came to us to speak about how the media can interact with us. And uh, we welcomed him coming to our team, and we welcome, in, welcome him always. And I just wanted to say that on your behalf. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'll be brief, because I know that time is uh, of the essence. And fortunately, I was told not to do a PowerPoint presentation, so I did a video instead. It's a minute and a half, and it will kind of encompass uh, what Channel 8 does as far as the drone division. I am the chief photographer. I've been a chief photographer for 20 years. Uh, I am the chief drone pilot of our station. Uh, our drone division just started in uh, September. I obviously fly under Part 107. Uh, I use LANs almost exclusively and the DJI FlySafe uh, to unlock my geofencing uh, to get my certificates when I'm in a zone that uh, requires it. Um, my whole purpose here uh, coming is kind of to dispel the, the news media myth about drones and you know everything associated negatively with drones. Uh, I will tell you that I work for the Hearst Corporation. Uh, Hearst is uh, obviously heard of, probably Hearst. Uh, we own uh, 26 stations throughout the country. The stations that do not have helicopters were given drones this year for the simple reason of cost effectiveness. Uh, obviously, to fly a helicopter, CBB, our sister station in Boston has one. 
is uh, $1,800 $1, a flight. Um, obviously, do the math. I fly a DJI Inspire 2. My whole kit is probably around $12,000. Uh, they gave us all the bells and whistles for the simple reason that they wanted us to put our best foot forward uh, going to this project. Uh, the unfortunate part for me was I get this giant kit at my station and I have absolutely no instructions on what I'm supposed to do with it. Yes, I went and took my test. Great, wonderful. That's like I use the analogy of going and get an F1 uh, driver's license and then the next thing I know is outside the door is an F1 car and I have to come in top 10 in the next race and I've never even been behind the wheel. So when I got the, uh, my license in July, from then until now, I've almost got like my PhD in this because I've had to really learn everything on my own. Yes, I've had help throughout the station. Uh, our, our hub is in Kansas City, which is uh, Neely Smith is in charge of the drone uh, division for the whole Hearst Corporation. But essentially, he said, you're going to have to just come up with your own standard operating procedures on your own, and we'll just go from there. It's a, it's a big learning experience uh, for us, obviously. Uh, I haven't never flown it since July. Uh, so my first, my first uh, point of uh, duty was to, you know, the, the media has a bad connotation now anyway, and I got to tell you, uh, being a professional journalist for as long as I have and what I've acquired in this uh, profession, I do get really offended when people have taken a, a negative look at what we do. We do not chase ambulances. I am not flying my drone like L.A. Uh, car chases down the street and, and hoping to capture that kind of stuff. Our, our drone division um, started with me actually getting uh, in touch with uh, Mark and Art Cleaves at EMA to be like, hey, we have this new thing. We don't want to hide anything. We, we, we don't want to be in the woods trying to get secret footage of a car accident or a house fire or anything to do with that. We want to be as completely open and trans, uh, transparent as possible. So I organized a meeting with uh, Mark and Art Basically, uh, Main State Police was down there as well. I invited everybody I could think of, first responders, police chiefs, fire chiefs, search around, anybody that, that Mark actually uh, helped me uh, and Art send out sort of an email blast about who uh, was invited to come, and essentially it was everybody. Uh, and the reason I did that was because I, I want to extend an olive branch to everybody saying, listen, you know, we're going to be there. We are the news. We are going to show up at car accidents, at fires, at scenes that you don't want us to show up with, uh, up at. But the reality is it's my job. And I want to kind of alleviate any stresses to do with this new sort of technology. Yes, you're used to seeing us show up with a microwave truck, a satellite truck, obviously cameras and, uh, you know, reporters and tripods. But now you've got this new flying uh, element added to it and I didn't really know about how to go about doing it so I was like well the best thing to do would be contact emergency management come up with kind of a, a standard operating procedure for our station I can't speak for NBC or CBS I represent ABC uh, I have no idea what other pilots are doing I have no idea what other stations are doing but I can tell you what we're doing and the number one rule is safety 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 I can't stress that enough. If I feel like I can't fly, I have no problem telling my boss I can't fly. I just did it the other day where I couldn't fly. Um, so I came up with a, a, a checklist, uh, a 32-point uh, check. Obviously, I don't have a PowerPoint because I was told I shouldn't. But <laughs> uh, that basically, I have to go through as a pre-flight checklist before I even take off. So once I've, I've you know, I've, I've gone through all this, our our unit consists of myself as the pilot and a camera operator. So I, am, I have the master controller, my, my camera operator has the slave controller. And we show up, we show up at a scene, uh, the first thing that we've, I've instituted as a policy is if it's a major event, obviously, you know, and I mean major event, I don't mean, you know, a minor fender bender at an intersection. We don't, you know, that's that's irrelevant. We're talking like the Sanford Mill fire or the Berwick fire or uh, you know the interstate being closed down for hours on end. Um, our first order of operation is to call EMA. Our assistant uh, assignment desk will call EMA, talk to whoever's in charge, and relay the message to the incident commander on the scene that says, "Hey, <coughs> Channel Eight is coming down. They're going to fly their drone. When he gets there, you know, who should he contact?" 
which is me. Uh, the last one, actually the first one we did was the Berwick fire not too long ago, and it worked flawlessly. I was told, hey, I have to go down to the Berwick fire. You're going to meet up with a camera operator down there. I said, okay, so make sure you guys call EMA, which they did. I got down there. I set up. And the very first thing, uh, Blaine from EMA came home and goes, yep, I just got a call from Mark that says you were here. No problem. And that's why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing is I don't want any of you to have any sort of um, reservation when you see me or you see our division show up that we don't know what we're doing, that we haven't sort of dotted our I's and crossed our T's. I, I'm not trying to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm not some kid flying it out of the, you know, the porch of a, of a house to get that one shot of you guys tracking a suspect through the crowd or whatever it is that you know, nefarious thing that, um, that would go along with drone surveillance. Um, I, I know I gotta get a little bit quicker. So uh, essentially, so how our operation works is we show up, uh, I cone off the area, I, have, I meet up with a camera operator, we discuss the flight even before we even put anything together, where we're gonna go, what we're gonna do, what the flight path's gonna be, how long we're gonna fly. And uh, once we've secured all that sort of, we've agreed on what we're gonna do, we go through the checklist together. Um, of course, I, I fill out my air map, my Lance uh, request, and I have to use my geofencing um, website if I'm in an area that, that requires it. Once I get all that authorization, I get the confirmation text that says, yep, here's your number, and I'm all ready to go. That's when I go through my, my, my pre-flight. And essentially, I am the visual observer. As the pilot, my sole responsibility is to always keep eye contact with that drone. And I don't fly it very far because I will tell you, I don't know how your vision is. My drone is rated for four and a half miles. I can see at best maybe a half a mile or a quarter of a mile, or three quarters of a mile. I just flew uh, in Farmington yesterday to do some transmission line shots with this new CMP corridor project. And I was on the top of a mountain, clear, uh, sunny skies, and I, and I could only see three quarters of a mile. I don't have uh, anti-collision lights on yet. I am getting those. Uh, and the reason that I want those is not to fly, you know, at, at sunrise or, or after twilight. It's so that I can actually see it better. I just want to be able to see the drone better. And I don't care if I had a big spotlight on there. That would help. Um, so I'm, I'm essentially going to play you a video of what I've done since uh, September till now. Uh, and I will take a couple questions afterwards because I, I, I really want to emphasize that these, this new program is not, you know, it's, it is replacing the, the traditional news helicopter and it's basically a cost-based reason why we're doing that. And so we're not going to be peering into people's backyards. We are not going to be, you know, anything negative uh, attached to a drone is what I'm trying to dispel uh, as far as a news gathering authors, uh, organization. Uh, I don't do these long flights as, you know, when you guys are doing your reconstruction or uh, mapping of areas. I essentially show up, we shoot the scene, I bring the drone down, I compress the video, I give it to the camera operator who's the, the, the camera person on the site for that scene, and then I'm off to my next, uh, uh, next assignment. So, uh, Tom, if you want to just play that real quick. Cross your fingers. Yeah. Hopefully <laughs> it works.
So that kind of encompasses what I've used it for. Uh, feature stories, breaking news. Um, uh, well, the, the talent that you saw in, in those videos, obviously the rules of part 107 is people associated with the production have to be you know, known that there's gonna be a drone flying with them. So those were all my reporters that I shot stories with. Um, I'm trying to, like, I know I gotta speed it up. So uh, is there any questions, first of all, about you know, like news gathering and, and drone usage that, that I can try to answer? Yes, so uh, we have what they call, you've probably seen now, uh, news organizations have what they call a TVU pack. It's a little portable cellular transmitter. And uh, I can uh, run an SDI cable from that transmitter to a sendence. My master controller has an SDI port, and I can live stream video back. It's a two second delay, but essentially it's live. You guys have a co-op to fly over people? What's that? It seems like a lot of the news footage is like over a lot of people. It looks like that, but it's not. I did a lot of after effects with the video to like do push zooms and, and stuff like that. No, uh, by law, I can't be within 20 feet of people. I will tell anybody that flies knows that the perspective of a drone, like I could be 50 feet away from you and it almost looks like I'm on top of you. So I, I was very, and I'm glad that you, you brought that up because I'm very aware of following the rules like almost to the T or to the T. I, I, my main goal is safety, 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 safety. And uh, I would never jeopardize anybody or anybody's property uh, by flying recklessly. Uh, yes, it does look like I, I did fly over people, but I wasn't over people. It just giving you that perspective that I was. And I did do a lot of in-house zooms with my editing software, so good question though. Did, did you have a zoom on the camera? Nope, no? it's, a fi it's fixed. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I can shoot in 4K, which I shot the ice breaking in 4K. Problem is, I had 12 minutes of 4K video and it took four hours to render it. And in news, I, that's not practical. So uh, I shot everything that you saw there in 1080 at 60p. I do 60p for slow motion effects. But now I'm actually going to 30p because I just, I need to get the video out. And how it works is when I show up, I have my little office on my, on my steering wheel. The, the camera operator is going to tell me what they want for shots. So I'm going to fly, he's going to shoot it, or she's going to shoot it. I'm going to take that video, they're going to go back to work with the reporter. I'm going to compress the video into one file, not just clips, and then I give that to them on a thumb drive. It's the only way that my Premiere will work with that clip. For whatever reason, I have no idea, but my Premiere, and I have a top of the line editing system, it just, it's all clunky every time you try to play it out raw. So the easiest way would be to compress the video for them, give it to them so that they don't have to worry about it. Because if, in news, everything is like this, and if I give them video that doesn't work, they're not going to use it. And that defeats the purpose of me even going there. So, um, yeah. Um, a lot of agencies have talked about like the concern about you know public privacy and whether you're yeah. over somebody's backyard. What's what's your take on it? Well, um, as in news, anything from the from a public view is is open to us. Now the difference is people don't own airspace, right? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, I think I've read pretty much everything I can on the subject and. It's a delicate subject. I'm not flying directly over somebody's house to take somebody swimming in their pool. Or and, and nine times out of ten, if I'm doing beauty shots, I'm up high enough where you wouldn't be able to tell who it was anyway. The other question would be, let's say I was doing a beauty shot and I actually saw a crime committed in somebody's backyard. That's a whole different level of I don't know. <laughs> All I would do is call a, a, a police organization along with my boss and probably the lawyers and they could figure it out. But people do not own airspace. So yes, uh, do they like it if you're flying over them? Probably not, but the way that I fly, I'm not flying at such a low altitude where you think that I'm spying on you anyway. And if I am flying at a low altitude, it's because I'm flying at a particular subject, meaning like your house was just on fire or there was just a crime committed there and it's been corned off. So. Uh, it is a question that I, I really don't have the answer to as far as, all I know legally, people don't own airspace. I know that there was a, uh, a case where, you know, the Air Force was flying and in interrupting somebody's farmer's chickens and they tried to develop some kind of 80-foot buffer zone as far as people owning from their property to 80 feet. 
as far as I know, that never even was gone to court as far as being solved. I don't know. But there's nothing that I found that's on the books, unless you guys can tell me uh, that people own the rights to the airspace in their back, back of their house or any of their property. I, 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 I would say no. Yeah, I think the feds, feds own it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, if I get, if I'm following all the rules as, as a Part 107 uh, commercial pilot, and I mean, let's face it, airlines and helicopters and every, Cessnas and every other small aircraft, they're flying over the same airspace, just at different altitudes. So, uh, again, I don't, I don't really, as far as, as far as my personal professional opinion, I don't think there's the case there because I've yet to see it. So I know that state, uh, like police agencies, have to follow different rules, um, but we're not, we don't have to follow those same guidelines. Can I ask you a, a different question? And, yep. and you don't have to answer this one, but. Um, I'll try to answer it as long as it doesn't get me in trouble. <laughs> sure. Um, have you ever been told you can't fly? Meaning by somebody on the ground? Right, like maybe uh, law enforcement or? or um, no. And that part of my outreach is to kind of make sure that that doesn't happen. Again, if I'm in a public space and um, I'm following all the rules, legally there's, no, there's nothing they can do to stop me from flying. I mean, I have my license with me at all times. I have my insurance card. My drone is registered. It's got an FAA tail number on it. And as far as maybe they don't want me there, but there's a lot of times, even when I'm not flying, and as a news photographer that I show up, they don't want me there anyway. But yeah, I mean, it, it is uncharted territory because it's just started. I mean, this is becoming more and more prevalent with news. And I'm just doing this as an outreach to be like, hey, we're not trying to hide what we're doing. And if you have any questions, you can call me, you can call my station. I'll gladly come and I'll spend as ever long it takes to kind of put you at ease to what we're doing. Because uh, the one thing that I don't want to be associated with is, you know, oh, Channel 8 was here, they didn't let us know we were coming, and you know, they took stuff that we weren't supposed to, I mean, I, I'm trying not to get involved with any of that, you know. I mean, obviously, I can't answer every question, and I can't do everything, you know, that everybody wants me to do, but I'm doing my best as far as to, to grow and to, to let everybody know that, you know, listen, we're not this bad, evil entity that we're being made out to be. So, sure. Like when we go to a special event, like the news stations and as well as the DOT, we run to the podium. Right. We put our microphones all over the podium. Yep. So I don't know that we've encountered that yet, where we all show up at a special event and we all have drones. Right. So, um, like, we'll all have our own little plan, but then we're all going to have to get together to say. Right. Uh, well. Sense. So I'll give you one quick example. Um, I got to go, right? <laughs> I, I don't usually talk this fast, but I was like, I got 10 minutes, so I'm trying to really get all the information out. So I'll use the ice, break, ice breaking with the Coast Guard video as, as a good example of that. I showed up. Obviously, I'm not with any controlled airspace. I'm free to fly. I'm on a public spot. Uh, the police know that I was there because I talked to the local police saying, hey, we're gonna get the Coast Guard coming up. Yep, no problem, go right over there. It'd be a perfect place for you to see it. Well, you know, then some other guy shows up with his Phantom Four, you know, that I don't know. And we start talking, he's impressed with my kit. And, and I'm, you know, we're just, we're just talking. And I says, you know, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go straight out there. I'm gonna go ahead, ahead of time because I, I don't know how much time I'm gonna be able to spend here. And I know I can see pretty far down the river. So I'm gonna go as far as I can see and I'll shoot maybe 10 minutes and I'll come straight back. He's like, great, well, I'm not gonna do any of that. I'm just gonna go straight up and I'm gonna get that. And I'm like, fantastic. Well, <laughs> as the ship got closer and we're doing our thing, I see a Phantom Four take off off the bow of the boat that I didn't even know was there. And my only hope is the guy that was flying that saw my drone, because my drone is considerably bigger than the Phantom Four. Uh, and as soon as I saw that, game over for me. I came straight back. Uh, so as far as coordination, I don't know. How I've worked it out with uh, Maine State Police, if there's an incident where I'm doing something that the state police are going to be flying their drone, I'm going to talk to their incident commander. They're going to tell me where they are, where they'd like me to fly, or if we're doing an accident, if they're doing an accident reconstruction, I've talked to Sergeant Foster. He says, okay, I'm going to do this. 
I'm going to be here, and I'm going to land. It takes me all about 12 minutes, and then after that, you can fly wherever you want. And that's, and that's perfect, because honestly, if you look at a drone video, I could watch a five-minute one-shot drone video and be like, oh, my god. I don't need Steven Spielberg's 50 angles of a car accident, you know? Uh, so essentially, that's the other thing is when, we, when we're doing drone footage, it's, it's pretty quick. A, I don't have the time to compress the video. So it's essentially, I'm flying to the scene, I'm shooting it for literally five minutes, and then I'm coming back. I do record everything from when I take off to landing. In case there's a catastrophic failure, I have evidence outside of the telemetry and the drone. I want to show my boss, listen, the reason this thing crashed was because of this. Or not crash, you know. But uh, anyway, so uh, anything else? Uh, sorry if I took too long. <laughs>